The government to change the law so people accused of sex crimes are no longer identified in the press unless they're charged. Would my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, look again now at changing the law so that a suspect is not named by the media, except in exceptional cases, until such time as they're charged. This morning, former MP Jerry Hayes has told the BBC that except in cases like the black cab rapist John Warboys, people should have their names kept out of the press. I'm firmly of the belief of someone who prosecutes and defends sexual offences that there's such a stigma attached to these um, cases that you're shackled with the reputation, no smoke without fire, for the rest of your life, even if you're acquitted. Therefore, there's a simple solution for all people accused of sexual offences. What should happen is, one, there's an, a presumption of anonymity, unless the prosecutor can actually persuade a judge that it's in the interests of justice, namely the war voice case, people coming forward. However, Katie Russell from the organisation Rape Crisis argues people accused of sex crimes should be named as they would if they'd committed any other crime. The reason why we feel that sexual offence suspects shouldn't be treated differently, there shouldn't be an exception for them, is that and that sends a message that those who've been accused of sexual offences are more likely to have been falsely accused than those who've been um, accused or are suspected of other kinds of crimes. Sadly, that's a widely held myth already. Ready, and it's a very damaging myth because we know that the vast majority of victims and survivors of sexual offences don't report to the police and among the reasons for that is their fear of not being believed. Well this morning I'd like your reaction. Should people accused of sex crimes have their names kept secret unless they're charged? Have your say on today's big phone in. 08081 The JVS Show. BBC Three Counties Radio. So before I take your calls let me just bring you more of the reaction to this High Court decision first from Sir Cliff himself. There must be something done up at that top echelon of people. There has to be something done that says you cannot do this again, you must not do it again. I was never even arrested, let alone charged, and I've had to suffer all of this financially and, but more importantly, emotionally. For what? For absolutely doing zero. And if heads roll, then maybe it's because it's deserved. It's been four years bar one month and four million pounds to lawyers in total of torture for him. There was a point, you know, a few years back in particular, when he was like skin and bone, you know, if he gave you a hug, he's just skin and bone. I think it'll take a while for it to seep in that he's actually won this case. Sir Cliff Richard was one of the great Englishmen of the 20th century. His persecution has been one of the great scandals of the 21st. Today it ended. Both the SYPD and BBC have been found guilty. The judge said that his privacy rights had been invaded, awarding him £190,000 in general damages, and then £20,000 because the BBC submitted the broadcast of the raid as scoop of the year at the Royal Television Society Awards, where it lost and was booed. The judge has also made clear that even if there'd been no footage of the search and the story had less prominence, the very naming of Sir Cliff would have been unlawful. This creates a significant shift against press freedom. It's very important in, in the world in which we live that there's a competitive media, a competitive environment, and part of that competition is trying to get stories before other people do them. And accusing journalists of celebrating a scoop is a bit like accusing footballers of celebrating a goal. Of course, journalists want to get to things first and accurately and want to uh, have them exclusively, if possible. That's just the nature of journalism. Well, you heard there Sir Cliff himself, his celebrity friends Gloria Hunniford and Paul Gambaccini, and fans singing one of his hits outside court. You also heard from the BBC Director of News, Fran Unsworth, arguing that this High Court ruling threatens the freedom of the press. And finally, you heard from BBC Director of Editorial Standards, David Jordan, arguing that it is in the very nature of a news organisation to give big coverage to stories like the raid of Sir Cliff's home. Well, I'm very keen to hear your reaction to this news story, and in particular, the call from Anna Soubry 
for a change in the law when it comes to naming and identifying people who've been accused, not charged, not convicted, but just accused of a sex crime. Pick up the phone, come on and have your say today. Should people accused of sex crimes have their names kept secret unless they're charged? Call Jonathan Vernon Smith now. 08081 BBC Three Counties Radio. Nick Freeman is a lawyer, author and commentator known to the media as Mr Loophole. Morning to you, Nick. Morning, Jonathan. Good morning. So I gather you go even further than Anna Subri was suggesting. You think that people should have their names kept secret unless they're convicted? Absolutely. Why? Because there, there's a presumption of innocence. And uh, the, the fact that somebody is accused of something doesn't mean that they've done it any, any more than the fact that they've been arrested means that they've done it. it. It's the start of a legal process which will either result in no further action or their acquittal or their conviction. And when they're convicted, then the public should know. But if they're acquitted, the public has no right to know. It's a private matter. And it's in accordance and consistent with the presumption of innocence. And it, so long as that presumption remains, then why should we know what someone has done the moment they're charged with an offence or someone, what, what someone is alleged to have done? It, it, it thwarts the trial process. It contaminates them. And the problem with sexual offences is there is a unique stigma that remains with you for life. And uh, it, it's fantastic news for Sir Cliff that he has got the result that he's got, but he will never recover from this. It, it, this will remain with him for the rest of his life. Um, it, will, it will have damaged him mentally, physically, emotionally, obviously financially he's recovered some money, that's not a priority for him, but he will go to bed and this will be on his mind for the rest of his life. And, and that is the, the essence of this unique stigma, which many people f- forget about, they don't understand. And what's important to remember is, complainants, unusually, who are involved in allegations of a sexual nature, have lifelong protection. Uh, And it's one of the very few offences where that is afforded to a complainant. In most offences, we're entitled to know who the complainant is. But in sex cases, we're not entitled to know, and there should be a level playing field. But that's always subject to a caveat that if we're dealing with uh, an alleged serial offender, then the Crown... On, on, on the basis of intelligence supplied by the police, make an application uh, and come forward and say, look, we believe A, B and C, and we think it's in the public interest that this person should be named publicly. And then, uh, as has happened in the past with various cases, members of the public who have been assaulted come forward. What, what we want to do is we want to convict the innocent, the, the guilty, and we want to acquit the innocent, but we don't want to ruin innocent lives. Uh, and that is what is happening time and time again. And it's happened here with Sir Cliff. His, his life really is ruined. As I said, he will never recover from it. You... Uh, and that is just totally unfair. And as a society, we should not allow it. We shouldn't condone it. And we actually need to take positive steps to prevent it. And in 1976, there used to be protection for both sides. And then it was removed. But you mentioned there the fact that sometimes when identifying people who've been accused, and there surely there is a difference with sex crimes in that the victims of sex crimes can also feel um, that it's something embarrassing, something they don't they don't feel confident talking about, and that is why. And we've we've seen this, have we not? Um, when you look at the Jimmy Savile story we've seen how people suffered in silence for years and years and years and never felt that they would be listened to they never felt the confidence to come forward and it wasn't until they realized other people were doing so that they then felt the confidence to come forward and say i too was a victim of this person and isn't that the positive to identifying people that sometimes what it does is it encourages other victims to come forward which can not only strengthen a case but also allows those individuals to to see justice done as well i agree with you completely jonathan and and that's why i'm saying in a case like jimmy savile or cyril smith the, the veil of anonymity which I'm proposing should be put in place would be lifted because the, the police had massive intelligence that both these people, and there are many others, were prolific offenders. And without question, a judge would have said, no, it's in the public interest. Uh, this particular person, this particular uh, accused person will not enjoy anonymity. And people would come forward. 
So but there, but there must no, be there is no disadvantage. But, but there what, must be I'm cases. Proposing is that we're, we're protecting the innocent. We're not producing innocent reputations. But when we're dealing with serial offenders, they're not going to be protected by anonymity. They're not going to have anonymity because it's going to be lifted. But there must be cases as well where even if we look at somebody who's not in the public eye, if you take, for example, a, you know, a, some kind of scout leader or something in a part of the country who um, is has been accused of assaulting children in his care and it's reported in the local press and other victims then come forward, you know, it, it, surely what you would do is you would protect that person's identity and then those other victims may not come forward in the first place. Well, if, if the scout leader, you know, look, a, a scout leader is accused, OK? Yeah. The police are going to start to investigate it and they're professionals and hopefully they know what they're doing and very quickly they're going to form a view actually this isn't a one-off because l little tommy who says he did this well there was jim jimmy there and jack and john etc etc uh, and very quickly the police are going to form a view and say that this is widespread we're going to a judge it's very much in the public interest we want people to come forward so that that anonymity wouldn't exist it's it's on the basis. But what if you've only on, on got one? What if you've only got one victim that comes forward? And what if the police but, but the, think the that police the person is on, is guilty? But the, but the the one victim, the evidence is a little bit flaky. Surely that person then may potentially get away with it if he's not identified in the local press. Well, if a victim comes forward, the police have a duty to investigate it. And in the course of that investigation, they will uncover whether or not this is prolific or whether it, in fact, just relates to one person. Uh, they're the professionals. They're best placed to decide what sort of defendant they are dealing with. And if they're dealing with someone, if they have any suspicion, back with some evidence. And, and bearing in mind now, you know, we have, we have computers, we have iPads, we have phones. You know, if somebody has been committing these sort of offences, that, that evidence will in inevitably exist. And it's not hard, it's not beyond the wit of man or the wit of the police to come forward and say, look, we, we have this evidence to present uh, and we know that we're dealing with somebody who is involved on a, multi, on, a, on, a, on a large basis, a widespread basis, and it's very much in the public interest um, that, that we um, name the person, not, not to shame him, but to encourage other people to come forward. Uh, and that would happen. There isn't a judge in the land who's going to say, no, I don't agree with you. So, Nick, so th th those people would not be prejudiced. It would allow the smooth access of justice, but at the same time, it would protect the people whose innocent reputations, such as Sir Cliff and many, many, many others. You literally pick up the newspapers every day, and typically you read of a, a university student who's been on bail, who's maybe endured a trial, and had his life totally ruined for 18 months, two years, before he's acquitted or before the case collapses in court, which obviously results in his acquittal. Why are we destroying these innocent lives? Why aren't these people being protected? Bearing in mind now that the vast majority of sexual assaults take place and, and the, the issue relates to consent. He, sh he said, she says, that's it. So we need to provide protection. It used to be provided. And, and we also have to bear in mind that the system of investigation is much more sophisticated. It's much more sympathetic now. Um, you know, people who used to come forward, they were I instinctively disbelieved. Now it's completely the opposite. Um, so they're dealt with very sympathetically by professionally trained people who are just specialising in this particular area. So it's a much more comfortable environment. And, and I would say this, and I have said it before, in my view, to encourage people to come forward, I would impose a, a time limit. And I would say that um, people would be time barred as a general rule after three years. And that would encourage people to come forward. And that, that's subject to exceptions. Obviously, it doesn't, wouldn't apply to juveniles or people who have mental health issues. But that we, we want to convict these people, and we don't want to let them carry on for years and years and years. So we, have a, we need to have something in place that is proportionate, that, that convicts the guilty, and ensures that innocent people don't have their lives ruined. And that's what's happening at the moment. Nick, good to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Nick Freeman, lawyer, author and commentator. No